All right, welcome again, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the webinar tonight. We are talking about smart writing. Uh, my name is Errol Williams. Uh, my details are at the bottom, so if you need to communicate with me, please do so via the Q&A. By the Q&A just above my head somewhere there, you will see a Q&A button. So please send me any information that you want me to respond to. All right, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Errol Williams. I'm happily married with six children and six grandchildren, senior pastor, regional overseer of around eight churches, also a national trustee of the Church of God of Prophecy UK Trust. I've taught systematic theology for over 10 years, 35 years experience in community initiative, 32 years experience in management training. I'm also a motivational speaker, something I enjoy tremendously. Um, internet expert, been on the internet since its inception, way back in the late 70s. Website developer as well as a professional photographer. Um, lots of skills in soft, software development. I used to run a software company actually. We used to um, employ over 250 trainees to actually learn the art of information technology, send them out on work experience and eventually into jobs. So I used to chair that company uh, many years ago. I'm a life improvement coach. I'm the author of these four books that you see on the screen. I would say that they're four of the best books ever written, but that's me. I, I would say anything, wouldn't I? Um, yeah. Um, I, sat, I ran for the parliamentary candidate, in, well, it was a Christian party, and uh, though I had the most, my claim to fame on that actually was I <laughs> got the most votes out uh, of the Christian party in the UK. Uh, my hobbies are chess, backgammon, dominoes, and I play a lot of sports in fact, so very, very excited about uh, my hobbies. Uh, sometimes it takes my mind off things and I'm able to get away from what I'm doing and just escape for a moment and then come back. All right, that's enough about me. We are looking at smart writing and the objective really is to have a clearer understanding of smart writing as I call it, create a clear and simple sentences that carry your message, select language you know that creates a concise and appropriate tone write so that people read and take action. This is one of the reasons why many of us write, is that we want some form of action to take place. Um, produce written work quickly and effectively. That could be tricky in, in a lot of cases for some people. But um, I like a statement which um, um, Winston Churchill made. He wrote a letter to someone, it was quite long actually, and he says, I'm sorry that I had to write you a long letter. I just didn't have enough time to write you a short one. I thought that was interesting because oftentimes it's easier to write a long letter, but when you have to sit down and really read it and think about it, it can take a little bit more time to write a shorter one. So uh, practice makes perfect, and this is something that is easy to do once we learn a few techniques. Benefits of tonight to you would be to improve your written output using clear English, uh, improve your own writing style and eradicate old habits, create effective and correct written work easily, and also have confidence in what you produce. I really want to talk about six key things, as I made mention in the advert I put out, and I uh, just want to go through those six key things, and then I will just share some other things about semicolons and colons and brackets and so on just to end off tonight's session. So let's start with tip number one if you like on smart writing. One of the first things that we should always establish whenever we are um, going to write an email, a book, a report uh, or even a letter is that we must first consider what is our aim? What is it that we are trying to achieve? In other words, let's prepare ourselves before we even get started. So why are you writing this document or this email or this letter or this book in fact? Um, who is the document for? You know these are questions that we have to ask ourselves at the very very onset because it's very important um, if we are going to spend a lot of time that we make sure we don't waste time and we make sure we get it right. 
uh, what do you want to, your readers to do? You know, what action do you want them to take? In other words, there should always be an action to get from any written document, um, whether this is for knowledge or specific outcome. So, you know, these are questions that we should ask. Would it be better to phone or or or, or meet the person? Would it be better to to phone or meet, uh, and so on? So it's very important, I believe, um, that in the preparation stage, we are clarifying our aim as to why am I doing this? Who am I doing this to? What do I want them to 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 do? In other words, to take uh, action. Or is there a better way, an easier way for me to communicate to them? For example, like the phone. I use the phone quite a lot to get the message across. Sometimes where an email would, would work or a letter would work, I'd just pick up the phone and I would phone the individual because I'm assessing um, this question, you know, in terms of the aim and prepare, preparation and so on. Now, when after you've asked these questions, there's another question that, is worth asking yourself is this that once you have clearly defined your aim ask yourself one more question am I writing to do any of these four things am I writing to persuade someone or a, a group of people to take action and then as I said before what action do I want them to take okay am I writing to inform or to explain something so it might just be that the letter, the email, the book I'm writing is just for information's sake. And I just want the action I want there so people to understand clearly what um, is being communicated. Am I writing to entertain someone or am I writing for discussionary purposes? So whenever you write, it will always fit, I believe, in at least one of these areas. It could be more, it could even be all of them. So it's very important, therefore, before you start writing, before you start putting the typewriter to work, before you start putting pay, you know, pen to paper, you want to ask yourself, why am I doing this? You know, who am I writing to? What do I want you know, them to do? And also, um, is there an easier way? And once you've asked that question, you want to ask one more question, um, am I writing to persuade someone? In other words, I want them to take a particular action. Because, you see, once you have the aim correct, then the rest of stuff f flows towards that. And I think that makes it very, very simple. So, you know, am I writing to persuade? Am I writing to inform or explain? Am I writing to entertain? Am I writing for discussionary purpose? When I wrote my f first book, in fact, I try to address these and it's interesting actually whenever you're writing a book and this is one of the tips that was always sh shared with me you never write a book for everybody you just write it for a specific segment of the market a particular group is it for women is it for men is it for an, a particular age group etc so it's very very important that you establish this and, and this will save you a lot of time a lot of energy, a lot of effort later because you don't want to go off on a tangent I wanted to discover, you know what, I don't even know what I'm doing or I'm going down the wrong route. So the very first thing when it comes to writing, whether it be an email, whether it be a letter, whether it be a report or whether it be a manuscript, a book, etc. You want to establish the aim. Why am I doing this? What's this for? What is the purpose of this email? What is the purpose of this communication by written form what is it that I'm trying to achieve am I trying to persuade someone am I trying to inform or explain something am I trying to entertain or am I seeking some form of discussion so it's very, very important so let me move on then to step number two and uh, step number two is quite interesting because it's to do with language okay it's to do with language and there's a tip I learned many, many years ago. Keep it short and sweet. The interesting thing about it is that almost everyone is busy these days. Almost everyone is busy these days. You know, what's, what's so funny, in fact, is that I, I get a lot of texts and also WhatsApp messages from a lot of different people. And it's amazing how I respond. And not just me as well. When I talk to other people, they are saying the same thing. 
is that long text is a lot of people just don't have the time to read them. They just don't bother with them. They just skip over them and or really brush over them very quickly and move on. But the shorter the text, the more people read it. It's, it's really is phenomenal. So it's it's important, therefore, that we keep things short and sweet. And that's a very, very good principle to adopt. Okay. So when we talk about languages, um, I want to talk about three key things in languages. You should use short words. Use words that your audience understand. Okay? If, you're, if your audience understand complicated words, then you use those complicated words. But if your audience don't understand those complicated words, then don't use it because not many people are going to take up the dictionary and look in it. A lot of people will just skip over it and you'd have lost that person, okay? So it's very, very important to use short words. Now, I was in a particular conference, not, well, many years ago, in fact, and the gentleman says the dichotomy of the situation was very complex. Now, a friend of mine sitting in front of me turned to me and said, what is dichotomy? I said, why are you asking me? I have no idea. Now, I didn't understand dichotomy, therefore I didn't understand the sentence. It is true to say, if someone is speaking to you or you're speaking to someone, and either of you don't understand one of the words in the sentence, then you don't understand the sentence. And that's why it's so very important, therefore, to speak that your audience understand. And that's why at the beginning, in terms of your aim, you ask yourself the question, who am I writing to? Okay. So if you're writing to children, as an example, then you're going to use the words that children understand. If you're writing to young people, you will also do the same thing. If you're writing to more mature students or more mature people, and you know they understand these words, then you will speak these words. So going back to my story, I had no idea what dichotomy was, and therefore I didn't understand the sentence. But however, I went home and I checked it out that dichotomy is the complexity between two things. So he was saying the dichotomy of the situation was so, so complex, or the difference between the two things, or the complexity of the two things. So it's very important, therefore, you don't use words that complicate and make people confused. Now, if you do use those big words, then no problem. Make sure you explain them. Because the, the purpose of writing and communicating in writing is that you want your audience to understand you the first time, all the time. We live in a very, very fast-paced society. Everybody is busy. Everyone is busy. People don't have time to take up a dictionary. They don't have time to try and figure things out. You have to make it as simple for them as possible. It's like you've got to look at them as dummies, in other words. You look at everybody as dummies and that you're writing to dummies. Now, there are the exception to the rule, but unfortunately, there are the majority is far outweighs those who do differently and see differently. So I say use words that your audience understands, short words. Now, the word communication has five syllables. Your audience understand it? Well, that's not a long word that's not a big word it's a short word because everybody understand it short words are the words that your audience understand long words are the words that your audience don't understand that's the point i'm trying to make so short words and i certainly also recommend short sentences okay short sentences it's interesting that actually i i often read a lot of sentences written by other people and I used to make the same mistake. And my sentences were an average over 26 words. Well, let's look at this principle here for a moment. Any sentence that have between zero and seven words, or let's say one to seven words, is very easy to understand. That's why children's books, if you look at children's books, they're easy to read. They break down the sentences. They're using words that the children understand. And you can see the principle at work there, and it really works well. 8 to 18 is very easy, and that's where we advise people. Is If you're writing an email or you're writing a letter or whatever you're writing, 
try not to go over 15 to 18 words. This is why I think the statement by Winston Churchill is so profound when he says, I'm sorry that I had to write you a long letter. I just didn't have enough time to write you a short one. So you can see there, writing a shorter letter will attract your more of your readers. Okay, this is a fact. All right. When you start getting into 19 and over to 25, it becomes hard. 26 and over is very difficult. I was explaining this through to um, a group of managers. I was running the certificate in management program for this train company. And I had set them an assignment. So I was giving feedback to, to them on their assignment. So I said to one gentleman, I read your assignment and one of your sentences were 43 words long. A gentleman beside him started to laugh. I said, don't you laugh because one of your sentences was 46 words. I mean, think of it for a moment. Look at a, a, a sentence as long as that. Doesn't that sentence becomes hard to read? Of course. So we advise, the advice here is between 8 and 18, but around the 15 to 18 mark is perfect. Okay? So try your best not to go over. Get yourself into a pattern that enables that to happen. Now, we strongly recommend you break up the page, if you, especially if you're doing you know, a page. And it doesn't even have to be a page. It could be a very short text. But if you break it up, it makes it easier on the eyes of the people who are reading it. So this principle here, if you're writing a book, we recommend that no paragraph should go over 11 lines. You should try to break it somewhere. Okay? And what tends to happen is it makes it easier on your readers to when they turn the page and they see those paragraphs, it makes it feels easier to them and more user friendly than you know text all the way down. As I said again, these are exceptions to the rule. There are some exceptions to the rules. There are those who love it the way sometimes people do it with no paragraph breaks. We also advise in each paragraph it should only have one thought per paragraph. So you only talking about one specific thing and not two or three or so. And again, these are um, principles and advice that we give. You know, people can always do differently if they want, but we would always say, I told you, or we told you so. So it's very important, therefore, that we use the language here of short words, short sentences, and short paragraph. In other words, Keep it short and sweet. Keep it short and simple. Or keep it short, stupid. So it's very, very important that step number two be adhered to. And it's a very, very important step, by the way. And one that many of us miss out. And the interesting thing about writing is, oftentimes what I've discovered is all some of us need is just one good tip that enables us to really get it right. Just one simple tip that enables us to get it right. All right. Let me move on then. And I want to speak about the third point here is the layout, the way the information looks on the paper or on the screen, whether it be an email, whether it be a letter, someone's opened up in Word document or in PDF format or a picture or even a manuscript. Layout is what you see first. And we often say you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Layout is what a page looked like. The arrangement of paragraph and the text in general, headings and graphics. And it's, it's very important that this concept be understood because this plays such a major, major role in many of the writings that we do. And there are people who are exceptional writers. They're really good at it. But the layout, the presentation of it, is not done in a professional manner. Okay? And in a, in a manner that is 
uh, acceptable to the marketplace. So, here is some thoughts. Remember, you do not always have a second chance to make a first impression. Just doesn't work that way. Very important that we understand that concept. So when we're talking about layout, it's the first thing a person sees. Now, I have my book here, which is here. And a person open up, let me open up a page. This is the layout, you know, the first thing people see. And so I'm going to come to techniques. There's a lot of techniques that I use on that page. In, in fact, every page. I'm just going to pick another page. And you can see again the layout. Um, it's, it's easy in terms of the paragraph. You can notice that uh, I followed what I'm teaching. I, I just want to share with you something. After I'd finished writing this book, you know, I'd finished writing it and 300, 300 and odd pages. And I went up to a bookstore to check out books that were in the same category as mine to see what tip I could pick up from their book that maybe I could, you know, you know add to my book. So I took a friend with me and we went down to um, Goma Street, Dillon's bookstore, the biggest bookstore, I believe, at the time in, in, in the UK. And I went down there to spend the day. Well, within half an hour of looking at the personal development or the life uh, skills development area, uh, our, it took us half an hour to realize that all the books there were very similar and that my book was in my estimation, have a little bit more layout to it, a little bit more focus and so on. So I, there's nothing that I could glean from that, and we were about to leave when one of us said, let's go to the marketing section. Let's go to the marketing section and see what we can learn from there. These are marketing books done by marketing experts. So I thought, wow, it's a very good idea. Let's go down there. And we went down there and we were there for the whole day. Because what I discovered in these marketing books and the tips that they left was as amazing, really. And that's where I learned the technique about language from. That's where I learned about language, short words, short sentences, and short paragraphs. The book also talked about layout, the appearance. It's interesting, actually, that when a man or a woman is going out, uh, going out, they're going out, they always work on the layout or the appearance, which is the layout. You know, how they look, how they appear, and so on. Well, your writing has to have the same care and attention. You have to put some form of investment or thought into the entire packaging of what you're doing. Because it's vitally important that we spend some time on the layout, the way the thing feels, the way it looks. Now we know, for example, that when a person goes into a bookstore and pick up a book, they only pick up that book based upon the, the, the way it looked, the appearance of the book. And generally, that would be the front cover or indeed the back cover. What we've noticed as well is that when someone picks up a book based upon the, the appeal to them through the way it's laid out, they pick up the book like this, they look at the front cover, and then they turn over and look at the back. I used to run a, a bookstore. And then they will look at the chapter. They have not yet looked at the inside of the book yet. They start looking at the chapter and what they would have to go through. And then they start to look in the book. But you see what they went through before they did that? Yeah, quite a few things. So we learned a lot that day from the marketing section. In fact, when I got back home, it took me a month to make the corrections that I found in the marketing store. One of these tips is the layout. When you do an email, always remember your writing represents you. It's a part of who you are. People judge you based upon what you send them. And that's why even when I send a text, 
and never send a text that's more than 160 characters. It's a principle I have that if the text that I've written is, is over uh, uh, 160, I will sit there for as long as it takes to bring it down. Even if it says 161 characters, I still don't, not happy. Got to come down because that's the principle that I have set. So every time I, let's say, text the members uh, and so on, um, I don't want them to delete my, my text. I really don't want them to. So the shorter it is, the more chances of it getting read. It's so refreshing to hear there's so many people who keep those statements that I've made and still have it on their, their phone. I was quite surprised to hear that someone was doing that. So lay out. Spend some time on how your email looks. Stop back and look at it and say, does my email represent me properly? Does that letter represent me? Because people are going to judge you based upon that. Even when I, as I said before, when I send out a text, I have to ask myself the question, does that text represent Errol Williams and what Errol Williams stands for? Okay, fine. It supports, so let's go ahead. Very, very important. All right, let me move on then from layout. As I said, layout is the way it looks. That's the first thing people see. Okay, so you're going to have to spend some time. It does, you know, does it look good? And the, the next area would, would actually, not the next area, but the year after that would add some points to layout as well. The next area is one-to-one. -one. Whenever you're writing an email, always know who you're writing it to, as if you're writing to only one person. You may also have a group of people you're writing to, but always take the attitude of, I'm only writing to one person, a specific person, a specific segment of the market. And you must know your, uh, you know, um, USP, as it were, unique selling feature, what makes you better than others and, and so on and so forth. So one-to-one, -one, you're focusing on one person. Now, here's some point. Always think of the readers by putting yourself in their position. In other words, if someone sent me this email, how would I feel? If someone sent me this letter, how would I feel? Would I accept it? If you say no, then it's no. But that's the way that that particular segment really works. Am I making life easier for the other person? How would I feel if I received this message as I said before? Is it interesting? Is it important? Finally, Will my readers understand the message immediately? And this is something that is very, very key. I'm sending, let's say I'm sending you, John or Peter, um, an email or a text. I want you to understand it straight away. I make the assumption that you're very, very busy and that you won't even have time to necessarily go through what I have. So how do you feel? So that's something that um, is worth looking at. Point number four, you're right into one person. Okay, bear that in mind. Okay, I, lo I love this and linking this to layout would be very, very powerful because techniques, you must always use certain techniques. Use techniques such as pictures. I mean, even the slide that you, you have here, I have been taught and I have taught people how to use PowerPoint, make it very very simple and very clean and very professional you don't have to have things you know like as if you were in a party or a particular disco where you want to make things more entertaining we want the people to focus on the learning hence the reason why we we use the slides in the way that you see them now and, and build upon each slide there are picture charts that you can use to convey your message bullet points 
that um, you may want to use bullet points. And I'll come back to the book in a moment. Um, double spacing. You know, sometimes we write in single spacing, um, especially with lawyers, they do a lot of double spacing and a lot of people love double spacing. Uh, memory aids, I use a lot of memory aids, I call them mnemonics and there are many other things that you can use. Different letter sizes, okay, if for example you're reading a book and then all of a sudden, you know, a few lines have it bigger, you feel, well I certainly feel pretty engaged. Um, different fonts that you can use or bold or color specific and very important um, points. So I'm just going to pick any page, any page. I can't see which page. Let me stop at that one and open that up and see the techniques I use. You can see I've got box and both sides. Okay, there is box that I've used and I put a quote in each box. You can see there um, and also right in the corner there. You can see that put quote. You can see also that I use numbering system in there as well. That's another technique. You can also see that I bold the headings. Um, that's a technique. So let me choose another one. Um, let, me, let me purposely choose this one. You can see, in fact, this was something I got out of the marketing book. You can see, for example, I had a little square triangle, if you like, and right here, I, I, I actually shaded it in. In fact, the shaded in I took it to, uh, when I was printing the book, I went to a printer in Newcastle and traveled all the way to Newcastle to get the book printed. And we, we had made an agreement for the company to print the book. And they sent me back what, what was known then as an Ozalid, which was the proof of the book. And they sent me a copy of what it would look like. And when I look at the, the book, they couldn't get the shade in, the shade right here, they couldn't do it. Or, or it didn't look like that. So I, I just cancelled that contract immediately. And I said, I need the shade. I mean, I spent so much time going through this entire book to do my shade and to try and make it easier for my readers and they couldn't do it. And when I went to Cambridge University Press uh, where the book was printed, man, they did such a phenomenal job. So in your writing, whether it be text, email, whatever you write. The techniques make it more user-friendly. It makes it more appealing to your audience. Okay? So that's why you will notice. Have you ever seen a book cover without some form of graphic, some form of technique? The idea of that is to pull you to the book. They're trying to find a head, headline, they're trying to find a picture, they're trying to find the appropriate font, colors, everything, to appeal to the readers that, hey, take a look at this book. So there are lots of books out there that they, they're not that great, if you like, in terms of content, but the, 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 the time spent on the front cover I saw many of those books. <laughs> a lot of people don't realize this. A lot of authors spend a lot more time in trying to get the cover of the book right than they did the content. Because we always say never judge a book by its cover. But unfortunately, we do. We do judge a book by its cover. We do it all the time. We judge people by their appearance or their layout. We do it all the time. So bear that in mind. Um, techniques are very, very important to use. And and final one is your structure. Your structure in writing. And you will see um, what I mean. B M M E stands for B stands for the beginning. Okay? Whenever you write, you're writing using these structures, the beginning, the middle, and the end. You always have a beginning, middle, and end. I, I have been told, actually, by a lot of pi by, um, pilots that the hardest part of flying a plane 
is the takeoff and the landing. The middle is generally very smooth, but it's the takeoff on the landing that creates so much challenges for them. And it's the same in writing. A lot of people don't start well. The beginning is not all that good. Middle is great, but the end, you know, just wasn't there. So here are two structures that I use, and I love one which we call AIDA or AIDA AIDA the attention what you're trying to do basically is to get their attention their interest desire and the reaction uh, this is not the fa my favorite I'm going to share my favorite one with you uh, I got it from John Cleese um, John Cleese who used to be the star in Fort Towers left set up a company called Video Arts uh, and started doing some training videos and he had some tips to share with us. I'm going to share that with you in a moment. But there are lots of structures out there that you can use. I'm just using some very easy ones to remember, two easy ones. And that, these are the ones I use oftentimes is get their attention, create an interest, get their desire, and get action. But I love John Cleese's four Ps. Position, problem, possibilities proposal position well I'm on my way to Birmingham and um, to go to a very very high powered meeting I have a sales um, presentation to do and I am only about a mile away problem well I've broken down on the motorway I'm in danger of being late, I'm losing out on this million pound contract. Possibilities. Well, I could either walk, I could hitchhike a lift, I can call the AA, call a friend to come and help me and so on. Proposal. I think I'll call the AA. In this case, maybe they might be able to come in time and help me out. And this particular structure is one, these two structures that I use. So even when I'm using the four Ps, I'm also in the back of my mind thinking of AIDA. I've got to get their attention. Okay, I've got to break their preoccupation. They may have been, you know, whatever they may have been doing. I want to want to get their attention. I want to create that interest and also a desire for action. And my presentation may follow the lines along the four P's. Um, here's my position. This is the problem. Um, here are the possible solutions. And here's my proposal. And I think when you follow that, it can make life a lot, lot more easier and, and make it more simple, in fact. These are the six years I talk about. The aim, let's always establish the aim. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Why am I writing? Who am I writing to? What am I trying to communicate? Is there an easier way to do this? And then after you've asked a question, ask another one. Am I writing to persuade, to inform? Am I writing to, to entertain? Or am I writing for discussionary purpose? Remember, the layout is the first thing seen. And lots of time should be given out to how things fit on the page. Just like how we would you know, dress ourselves to go to a wedding, that's also a layout, or you could call it appearance. The same way we must take pride and care in our layout of our writing, because remember, whenever you write or text, it, it represents you. It says something about who you are. So if you write a letter to someone, and there are lots of grammatical errors and spelling mistakes, they're going to judge you big time on that, especially if you apply for a job and you're making spelling mistakes, especially when we've got grammatical correction software and, you know, spelling um, software, so we should never be getting those things wrong. Always remember, it's, your, it's a one-to-one. -one. You, you, you must write as though you're only writing to one person, where in, in a lot of cases you are only writing to one person, but if you was doing a book, well, I'm just writing this book for this person. And I want to make sure, you know, they understand it straight away. 
going back to language, remember it's short words, it's short sentences, it's short paragraph. You know, you want your, your audience to understand you first time, all the time. Layout, very important. One to one, write as though you're writing to only one person all the time. Remember, there are lots of techniques out there. You don't want techniques to replace your writing. You just want it to support your writing. And remember the structure. Aida, you want to get their attention. You want to create that interest and desire and move them to action. Remember the four P's. This is the, this is the position. Here are the problem, possibilities, and possible solution. And then you want to make your recommendation. Just a few things on a few things that a lot of people get get all tied up about but let's look at colon colon introduces a list horizontally etc in the text or also vertically below it may also be used to amplify a point or give a reason for a point in a sentence so an example could be the following items are needed or you could say please purchase the following items for me paper pen computer telephone so colon is used to introduce a list either the list is horizontal in the text or vertical or it can also be used to amplify a point or give a reason for a point in a sentence so a lot of people don't understand what you know colons are used for semicolons on the other hand um, are to link uh, separates two linked ideas in a sentence but each idea must have a main verb okay a semicolon is just like a full stop except that the word after it does not start with a capital letter so for example <clears throat> use the semicolon to connect independent clauses so you you can also use a semicolon to replace conjunctions between two independent clauses so the example here would be tuna casserole uh, roll is an excellent dish you could actually put a full stop there and stop now you could say my baby sister despises it so the point here is with a semicolon it can replace a conjunction it's one of the easiest ways I have found you know in using it where I you know I, I could put a full stop there then I know that a semicolon could also replace that so you can use a semicolon or the full stop, um, etc. If, if you so wish. And a lot of people just don't know how to use colons, semicolons, and oftentimes I've seen them use interchangeably and so on, but just not realizing that they do have a specific purpose and a role to actually play. Um, comma, on the other hand, separates the logical parts of a sentence or a list of items in a sentence. But if you do not need one for clarity, well then don't put one. Now remember what I said earlier when you we talk about language, short sentences. Now if your sentences, for example, are like children books, you'll find that you'd be using less commas. But the longer you write, you might need to put more commas in than you would necessarily need to do. Okay, so very very important now quotation marks as you can see here there are two that's often used a single one a double one sometimes used to indicate special use of a word or to aid clarity so sometimes a person writes a particular sentence and they may put a a you know just a quotation mark a single quotation mark a single quotation mark and it's to, it's to actually um, indicate special use of a particular word <coughs> Okay, it's a group of words from a text or speech repeated by someone other than the originator, hence the two quotation marks that is used as speech marks. So one is used for um, the amplification of a particular word, trying to make a statement within the sentence, you know, tr highlighting that particular word, emphasizing it, whereas we have a speech mark whereas someone who is saying something other than the the originate the, the originator a group of groups from a text or speech repeated repeated by someone other than the originator so it's very very important therefore 
that we bear that in mind. All right. The next one is brackets used to give an example or to add a bit of information for the reader. And just going back to the quotation marks, single quotation marks, sometimes people use single quotation marks in the same way they use the brackets, okay? Used to give an example, okay? Or to aid a bit of information for the reader. These brackets, um, if you notice, going back to these brackets, we strongly recommend where you use these brackets, you don't use these brackets. In fact, I've, I've never in my entire reading history ever seen those brackets used in a sentence to actually emphasize anything. So um, I just thought I'd put these in today, but we advise don't use those anyway. Apostrophe, and uh, again, we have seen apostrophe used a lot, um, denotes the possessive as in Robert's book, so a book belonging to Robert, hence where you would use that, or James's report, and notice how you can use it, you can either use it before the S or after the S, and sometimes people may debate as to where is best to put it, and so on, you know, James's report also indicates a missing letter as in don't or won't or couldn't. Um, we, we, I strongly advise but don't use it for the purpose in business writing. If you're writing a business report we strongly recommend that you don't necessarily don't use it. Try to avoid them from a business standpoint. But nothing wrong if you did use them. Okay, It's, it's just the way it is and our advice okay let me move on to the hyphen hyphen either splits a word up or joins two words together uh, when you join words together think of the meaning as in leads based okay uh, and staff or multicolored paper so oftentimes um, people use these and um, you know the good thing about some of the software that we use, like Microsoft Word and so on, it always gives you example where you can use them. So that's a very, very good thing for us grammatically and so on. But as I say, it's a word used to link two words together, as in leads based or multicolored. Oftentimes, you know, it's you would see the word multicolored without the hyphen, depending and the author's view and you know way of communicating at that time. Oblique, you may have seen these about, can be used for sir, madam, or he, she, or half. Um, these are either ugly or ambiguous sometimes, and um, the advice is try to avoid them as far as possible. I, I know that, you know, for example, in Dear Sir, Madam, um, you know, it's either it's a sir, it's either a male or a female. I'm not sure who it is, so I put Dear Sir, Madam, or he, she, and so on. So it, we, we try to avoid them, but you can use them. There's nothing wrong with that. The eclipse, ellipse, okay, these three three points, you know, the ellipse are three points. These three points indicate that something is missing. You can have it at the beginning of the sentence, which indicate that there is something missing at the beginning, or you have it at the end, which indicate that there is something missing at the end. So people get an idea to realize that something is, is missing in that sentence, and it's done purposefully. Okay, um, that's the end of that. just wanted to check if there are any questions, if anyone had any comments for me uh, at all. I want to say welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for joining. If you have any questions or comment, please, please don't hesitate to, to communicate with me either by email or by text. Um, by my mobile at the bottom, you can communicate with me in any way. I hope that this session was, <coughs> was useful to you and um, as I mentioned again, just going back over those six key points that uh, I mentioned earlier, just want to um, go
go back to those slides just to wrap up this session and then just say something to you and, uh, and let you go. But hopefully, okay, um, let me try and find these slides. And so, as a matter of fact as well, if you want these slides, these slides can be yours. So all you have to do is drop me an email and I'll be happy to submit these to you. So as I said before, six key points in terms of smart writing. I've, I found these to be, you know, very, very powerful in my writing over the years. And first of all, it's the aim, you know, why am I writing? Who am I writing to? What is it that I'm trying to achieve? Is there an easier way of doing this? <clears throat> Once I've established that, am I writing to persuade someone to inform them? Um, am I writing to explain? Am I writing for discussionary purposes? So very important that you establish the aim, the preparation. You get that stage right first before you put, you know, your fingers to the typewriter or pen to paper. Language is very important. This was the one of the greatest help to me was in the language, you know, keeping it short and sweet, short words, short sentences, and short paragraph. <clears throat> and I've learned over the years. Uh, how to make things as short as possible while still saying a lot within within that. So always speak the language of the people that you're writing to because once you have established who you're writing to, then you know what language to use. Layout is what you see first. Believe it or not, and I want to say this again, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And whenever you write, whether it be a text, or whether it be an email, or whatever it, it may be, it represents you. It says something about you. So you're, you want to make sure your writing represents you in the best possible way. And that's a very important thing. When you write, you don't write to everybody. You write to one person. Okay, That's a habit that we ought to get in. And oftentimes, when I'm writing a letter to a group of people, what I, what I, what I do is, when I'm writing the letter, I put one person's name there and I pretend I'm only writing to that individual to start with. And I, fi I, I find it helps me to focus on, on you know, the one-to-one -one aspect um, and so on. And it really gets me thinking that I'm not writing to everybody in the world. I'm not writing this book for everybody in the world. I'd like everybody in the world to re read it, but I'm only writing it to this particular segment of the market. <clears throat> and that's my intention. Techniques are very, very important, okay? It's how you use them. It's very important. You don't have to try and, you know, replace your writing with them. Even in text now, they're sending out these, uh, what they call these, these little pictures of the smileys or whatever they call them. But now they've even introduced them into text. You know, it's amazing. A picture speaks a thousand words. So pictures are very important. So you want to make the writing easier for your reader. You want to make it easier on your reader. Will they really appreciate this? Would you appreciate it if someone said you that? And uh, finally, the structure. Hey, Aida, the attention, the interest, the desire, and action. You always want some form of action towards what you're writing. Remember the four Ps. Uh, I love those four Ps, position, problem, possibilities, and proposal. So very, very important. I just want to close off with just um, two slides here. Um, I, I run two seminars every week um, on a Monday night, Bible studies, and also life improvement tips every Thursday. You can catch me <coughs> at any of those um and contact details, their mobile phone, or even on the email address. And if you would like to support what I'm doing, you know, in keeping um, th this online show going, and you'd like to donate to some of the projects I'm involved in, just go to that email address and uh, take a look around um, there. If you want to make donations, you can always email me as well. Or you can 
text me or contact me and I'll be delighted to hear from you. So I want to say thank you so much for coming by tonight. The time is up and I've got to let you go. And um, this recording has been recorded and if you um, would like a copy of it, just text me and we will see to it that we, we show you where the link is on YouTube. So take care of yourself. I hope this session has been of use to you. Um, really do appreciate all of you um, coming online and thank you uh, for coming and wish you all the best for the coming weekend and take care of yourself and your family. Bye for now.